Good morning, everyone. My name is Carla Frolic. I'm at North Carolina State University, and I'll be giving two lectures today because I was stuck in Raleigh on Sunday and couldn't make it. So the two lectures are structured that the first lecture is more on the physics on how do, what do we know about heavy element synthesis, and the second lecture will be more technical on how do you simulate nuclear synthesis, what are the ingredients, what are the difficulties for on the computational side. So let me start with showing you this figure that you've certainly seen many times before, which are the solar system abundances. So you have on a log scale, the abundances as function of the atomic mass. So this plot has red dots and a black line. They're both, oops, um, they're both measurements of the solar abundances, but from different years. So you see that there's a little bit of a variation, but over about four decades or so, but the overall pattern remains the same. And some of these um, features we see here, we can explain very easily. For example, you see here hydrogen and helium, very high abundances, they're made in the Big Bang. You see here in between some odd even staggering, the elements with the high abundances are the alpha elements, so things like carbon 12, oxygen 16, neon 20, and so on. These elements are predominantly made in stellar burning during the star's life. You see this predominant peak here, which is the iron group. And then if you go to um, heavier nuclei from the iron group, you see that the abundances are many orders of magnitude lower than over here. And we can understand this if we remember the nuclear physics and nuclear binding energy. So here I show you the average binding energy per nucleon in MeV as function of the numbers of nucleons. And you see that the binding energy steeply rises, it, it peaks around the iron group, and then it goes down again. So if you want to um, generate energy in nuclear reactions, on the left-hand side of this vertical line, if you do fusion from lighter um, nuclei to heavier nuclei, you gain energy. This is the nuclear fusion that occurs in stellar cores during the star's life that generates the energy to balance gravity and um, keep the star alive. So as long as you go from hydrogen towards heavy elements up to iron, you're generating energy in nuclear fusion. So most of these elements you make by charged particle reactions. So for example, in a very simple picture, you would capture helium on this carbon to make oxygen. Of course, there's other reactions going on, but you can capture things like alpha particles or protons. If you want to make these heavy elements here on the right-hand side, fusion, won't, of lighter elements to heavier won't generate energy, but actually need, require energy. So this doesn't help you. And adding charged particle gets more diff difficult, so we need to look at other mechanisms how to make these heavy elements. So things are, that could work are, for example, capturing neutrons. They're not charged, so they're easier to capture. You can do reactions with photons, so pho photo dissociate heavy nuclei, or you can make use of the neutrinos. So we already have a first idea why these abundances are much, much lower if you, for nuclei that are heavier than the iron group. Two features you see in this um, heavy element tail is that there's these double peak features here. And by indicating them in two different colors, I already give you a hint that they have two similar but different origins. If you think of the simplest idea to make these heavy elements, which is neutron captures, you can actually have a picture where you can have two processes that where neutron captures dominate that make all of these heavy elements. So this figure here is the a zoom in on this right hand side part here. And you can, the two dominant reactions in this um, idea of neutron capture processes are neutron captures or N-gamma reactions which are indicated here in blue. So you take a nucleus with Z protons and N neutrons, you add another neutron, so the mass number increases by one, and your neutron number increases by one, and you have a photon for um, energy conservation. You can't indefinitely add neutrons, so the other reaction that's important are beta minus decays. So you take a nucleus with Z and N, Z protons and N neutrons, and it decays by emitting an electron and an antineutrino which increases the proton number by one and the neutron decreases the neutron number by one. 
So with these beta minus decays, you move to an element that's the next element in your periodic table. So that's how you move to heavier elements. If you combine these two reaction types, you can compare their time scales. And you can distinguish between a situation where the beta decays, so the green reaction here is much faster, and then the neutron captures, or you can have the opposite where the neutron captures are much faster than the beta decays. And that's how we de um, distinguish between what we call a slow neutron capture process and a, a fast or rapid neutron capture process. So rapid means the neutron captures are much faster than the beta decays, which is here in red, and slow means the beta decays are much faster than the neutron captures. And combined, these two processes make more or less these heavy, this heavy element pattern. So if you think about these two processes, slow and fast neutron captures in terms of nuclear physics, so here I show number of neutrons on the horizontal axis, number of protons on the vertical axis, each box is an isotope, each line here is an element, and the color coding, so black are your stable isotopes here, and the color coding, the non-black squares tell you the decay, the Q value for decay. So basically the further away you go from the black stable isotopes, the shorter the half-life. Want to point out here N of 82, the closed neutron shell, and so if you think about neutron captures and beta decays in this chart, neutron captures are reactions that move you one to the right. You stay in the same element, but you add one neutron. And beta decays go diagonally up. You can internally convert a neutron to a proton. So if I zoom in on part of this chart and show you where this slow and rapid neutron capture process, what their paths look like. So down here in red, is a typical path for the rapid neutron capture process or R process. What that means is you have, because the neutron captures are faster than the beta decays, you have several neutron captures before that occur in sequence before the first beta decay occurs. If you look up here for the S process or slow neutron capture process, the beta decays are faster than the neutron captures. So at most you capture here one neutron you, for on this stable isotope, you're unstable, you beta decay, you capture one more neutron, you beta decay. There's several stable isotopes, of course they can't decay, so you do a few neutron captures here, but basically this S process moves very close to the stable isotopes, whereas the R process, because of these many neutron captures that are very rapid, you're far away from stability. Now, I highlighted this N equals 82 closed neutron shell. So once you reach the closed shell, even in the R process, you're only capturing one neutron and your beta decaying back because this is a preferred configuration. So here the path is a little bit different. For the S process, you're only one unit away from stability, so here the path is very similar. So now imagine a situation you have an R S process and you have an R process, and these nuclei are unstable. So at some point, before you observe them in stars, they have to decay to stability. So you don't actually observe these unstable isotopes out here that are very short-lived, but you observe the stable isotopes that these decay to. And this is indicated by these yellow arrows here. So these nuclei you make out here in the R process, they decay back to stability via beta decays until they reach a stable isotope. So now that means for the R process, once you hit N of 82, the close neutron shell, what you're really populating are these tellurium and xenon stable is um, isotopes. Versus for the S process, you hit the N of 82 closed shell at barium, so you're populating things like barium and lanthanum. So if you go back to here, you see that tellurium and xenon are the peak for the fast or rapid neutron capture process, and barium is where the peak for the slow S process are. So the location of these peaks and that they're shifted between this fast and the slow neutron capture process you can explain very easily with the nuclear physics how many units from stability do you reach a closed shell. And obviously, because this is a closed shell, you will have increased abundances here and here, and they decay back to these stable barium and lanthanum for the S process, or things like xenon and tellurium for the R process. You can make the exact same argument for this other double peak feature over here. So it's a closed neutron shells that you um, in this picture of neutron captures and beta decays that explain these two double peak features.
So let me talk a little bit more detail about the S and the R process. So the S process is in terms of, if you think about galactic chemical evolution that you learned about yesterday, you want to know, does this, can this occur very early on in the galaxy or do you need other things? And then from a nucleosynthesis perspective, we distinguish between primary and secondary processes. Primary meaning you don't need any pre-existing nuclei. This can happen in the very first generation of nucleosynthesis. Secondary process means you need some pre-existing nuclei. So this cannot happen in, say, the very first stars. So the S process is a secondary process. You need iron group nuclei for these neutrons to capture on. If you think back here, you need some stable um, down here iron isotopes that you can start this S process. So it's something that you can't observe at the very lowest metallicities or very, very early on in galactic chemical evolution. And we'll come back to this point at the end of this first lecture. For the S process, we distinguish between two, two types. There's a strong or main S process, and then there's a weak S process. The strong and weak basically characterizes how high in mass or in, in your periodic table you can go. So the strong S process, you can go all the way up to lead. For a weak S process, it's truncated probably around proton number of 60 or so. It depends on the conditions. So the strong and main R process occurs in AGB stars, so asymptotic giant branch stars. Low mass stars, um, towards the end of their evolution, you have sh helium shell flashes. And these helium shell flashes are basically explosive ignition of, <coughs> of um, helium burning. So triple alpha process, this reaction is extremely energy dependent. So if you start having the triple alpha process, you release a lot of energy. In these hel helium shell flashes, you have mixing between the different layers in your star. So you mix protons from the hydrogen shell, which is on top, into this region. And so now you have protons. You have helium burning, so triple alpha process, which makes carbon-12. And if you have protons in carbon-12, you can make carbon-13. You're also in, you have a lot of um, helium or alpha particles. This actually should be an alpha, not an A. <coughs> So once you make carbon-13, you can capture alphas on this carbon-13 to make oxygen-16, which if you remember your nuclear binding energy figure from a couple slides ago, has a higher binding energy than its neighboring um, isotopes. So it's favorable to make oxygen-16 and you emit a neutron. So here is your neutron source. Those are neutrons <laughs> for, um, that are needed for the S process. This is a very strong neutron source. So you have lots of neutrons, and the time scale is right, so you can, this S process can go all the way up to lead. You can also have a slow neutron capture process in massive stars, but in different layers. So in massive stars, it's in core, bur core burning phases. So if you burn helium in the core at about 1 to 2 times 10 to the 8 Kelvin, or if you burn carbon in the core at slightly higher temperatures, there's also reactions that allow to um, that emit neutrons, and these neutrons can then be used for an S process, but for several different reasons, you cannot, there's not enough neutrons to go all the way up to lead, but it truncates earlier. That's why we call it a weak S process. So if you think of core helium burning, the, um, the neutrons come from a similar reaction as in the strong S process. So again, an, you capture an alpha and you emit a neutron, but this time it's on neon-22. So you have some nitrogen-14, you have to do a series of reactions until you get to neon-22. You're in helium burning, so you have alpha particles, you capture an alpha neon-22, you emit a neutron, make magnesium-25, and this, these neutrons here are the neutron, one of the neutron sources for the weak S process. In core carbon burning, you have, obviously, your fuel is carbon-12, you can capture proton on carbon-12 to make nitrogen-13, which decays to carbon-13. And then this is the same reaction, carbon-13, alpha-N to oxygen-16, as up here. But the difference is, in the strong S process, remember, your protons are mixed in from the hydrogen shell. They're already there. In core carbon burning, you've exhausted your hydrogen in the core. So these protons actually come from other reactions during carbon burning. So carbon-12 plus carbon-12 gain a proton, and then a sodium-23. 
And here, these alpha particles, again, same reaction as up here, but some of these alpha particles, you've basically exhausted in car core carbon burning, you've also exhausted your helium in the core. So these alpha particles have to come again from other reactions that occur during core carbon burning. So carbon-12 plus carbon-12, you can also emit an alpha and produce a neon-22. So both of these protons and alphas that are critical to make the carbon-13 and then to capture on here to emit the neutron, they're secondary products. They come from reactions. They're not just there like in the strong S process. So that's another reason why this weak S process is only weak. So sh here I show from a calculation, stellar evolution calculation, what a weak S process yields could look like. So this is for a 25 solar mass, massive star, um, very low metallicity, 10 to the minus 5. And what I show is abundances relative to the initial abundances. So you this star doesn't have zero metallicity, so it starts out with some abundance of heavy elements. And you measure after this weak S process takes place, how much relative to what you had before, how much do you have at the end. So this horizontal line is one, which is if you have exactly the same amount before and after, this is where your points would lie. The horizontal axis is atomic number. The different symbols are for different models. They're all 25 solar mass stars, but they have different um, initial rotation. So some of these models are very, very rapidly um, rotating. So for example, the stars are at the stars and the diamonds are, are at initial rotational velocity, half of the critical velocity. And you can see, depending on how you choose your initial rotation, you make more or less of this weak S process. So if you go very rapidly rotating and you also start playing with the rate, so this is a rate from Coughlin and Fowler 88 divided by a factor of 10, you see that those stars are actually, they, you can produce a little bit of, of lead more than you had before. But if you exclude sort of this extreme model, all these other curves truncate around sort of the barium, barium region. So you make some of these light rest process elements, but you don't go at significant amounts all the way to lead. And again, as I said before, the neutrons and, sorry, the protons and alphas here come from reactions. So this is for the slow neutron capture process, which we understand a lot better than the rapid neutron capture process, or R process. So here for the R process, first of all, the R process is a primary process. You don't need any previous generation of nucleosynthesis. So this plot is a little bit busy, so it has underlying, again, proton numbers, function, and neutron number. So each square here is an isotope. Again, black are the stable isotope. The um, neutron deficient or proton rich side of the chart here is left out because this R process only occurs on the neutron rich side. The color coding is on a log scale, the beta decay half life. So the more red, the further out you are, the shorter lived these nuclei are. There's in magenta here a line, which is an illustration of the R process path, which again occurs far from stability. I highlighted a few elements on here just to give you a reference point. Iron down here, silver is roughly here, and gold is roughly up here. If you have this R process, at the end, all of these short-lived nuclei will decay to stability, so they will populate these magenta isotopes here. And if you plot the abundance of these magenta isotopes here on this tilted plot, so on a log scale abundance as function of the mass number, you see again this pattern, and you'll notice that of this double peak feature that you see in the solar abundances, now you only have one peak because this is only our process. All right. So what do we know or what do we need for an R process? So for the site, there's two, the two most important criteria are you need a high neutron density because remember you want to capture many neutrons before the first beta decay occurs. And you want to eject this material because that's the only way it gets added to the galaxy and you can use it in chemical evolution, you can use it for the, your next generation of stars. In terms of neutron sources, you can have neutrons from nuclei that you somehow liberate. You can go to neutron stars, you have a high abundance of neutrons there. Or you can use weak reactions that can convert protons to neutrons. These are all options to um, give you neutrons. It turns out we know two sets of conditions that allow us to simulate this R process abundance pattern. 
So we can say we need a high entropy with an alpha-rich freeze-out, meaning you have lots of alpha particles left in when nuclear reactions stop, and your Ye, somehow this disappeared, the Ye only has to be moderately low. So it has to be neutron-rich, but not extreme. Ye is, by the way, is the electron fraction, which measures how neutron-rich or proton-rich um, your environment is. If it's below, the Ye is below 0.5, it's neutron-rich. If it's above 0.5, it's proton-rich. The other set of conditions is if you have low entropy with a normal free set and very, very low Ye, so maybe 0.1, you can also get an R process. The more difficult question is, where do we find either one of these conditions in nature? And there's many different sites that people have considered and studied. I grouped them a little bit. So the first block is all things related to core collapse supernovae, either of iron cores or of oxygen and magnesium cores. So probably the most popular in the core collapse category is neutrino-driven winds. So you have a core collapse supernova, you make a neutron star, this neutron star cools by emitting neutrinos. These neutrinos drive a wind, and that's um, one of the sites that where the R process could occur. Other things people looked at is in the helium shell. So you think of your massive star, you have the supernova explosion, you have a helium shell further out. The shock wave will run through that helium shell, increase the temperature there, and maybe that allows for an R process to occur. So the illustration here is up here. You have these different layers, so the shock wave travels outwards. It'll hit the second to last layer, which is the helium layer. Maybe we need special types of core collapse supernovae, for example, some that make jets. So this figure here shows in the 2D plane where you have much stronger ejection along these polar axes, so here are your jets. Maybe it's not spherically symmetric and the wind in general doesn't have these conditions, but if you collimate your outflow into jets, maybe that's um, a site for the R process. And then instead of collapsing your regular massive star with an iron core, maybe you can use slightly lower mass stars that have oxygen and magnesium cores that also undergo core collapse. So maybe those form conditions for the R process. Your other option is to look at compact object mergers, like neutron star, neutron star mergers, or neutron star black hole mergers. And there's several um, ways of how you can eject material in those events. So you can have ejection from the tidal arms. You can have an, an accretion disk forming around the compact object, and you have outflow from this accretion disk. And you can even have shock ejecta from the merger. So there you have high neutron densities or high neutron numbers because you're merging two neutron stars. So that could be the low entropy, very low Ye scenario. Then of course you can um, think about more exotic things. What if you have neutrino flavor oscillations either between regular flavor or even adding in a sterile neutrino? If you change neutrinos from one flavor to the other, that could affect your Ye and maybe that'll give you the right Ye in a scenario that has otherwise would work for the R process. I'll come back to all of these ideas a little bit later. So with all of this, we have a, we can pretty much explain all of these features, except that there's a few details, small features that you can't see on here that we haven't explained yet. So again, this is um, proton number on the verti vertical axis, neutron number on the um, horizontal axis. Now for a change, the stable isotopes are in this orange here. And the um, green ones have very long half-lives, so there's three of them. And then in um, magenta, you have unstable nuclei. So these arrows that formed while I was talking are an S-process path. So again, one neutron, neutron capture to an unstable, one beta decay. But you'll notice that there's orange stable isotopes out here that the S-process can't reach because this will, will not decay in this direction. And you, there's basically, for example, this um, Tungsten 180 is shielded from an S process by all of these other stable isotopes. Now, if you add in an R process path, you'll notice this, the R process would occur out here, far away from stability, decays back. And if you decay, for example, here to tungsten 186, this isotope you make by the R process, but the S process will not make this isotope. So there's some isotopes that are only made by the R process, and there's some isotopes that are only made by the S process. So they're highlighted now in their corners, but we still have the problem of these guys out here. So we need 
So these are nutrient deficient nuclei that we call P nuclei because they're on the proton rich side of stability and they cannot be made by the SRDR process. They're very low in abundance compared to, to the um, bulk of, of the um, R and S process abundances. So again, here are the double peak, peak features from the R and the S process and then down here are these P nuclei. So there's um, about 2,000 or so of P nuclei that have much lower abundances than the other nuclei, but they cannot be made by the S or R process. And originally, there's sort of as a global term for these P nuclei is the P process was suggested in the 70s. Now we understand or we think of the P process as, as being different processes with the gamma process now being what originally was called the P process. And then there's other processes involving neutrinos like the neutrino process or the neutrino P process that can also make some of these um, P nuclei. So let me talk briefly about the gamma process first. So the idea here is you have pre-existing heavy nuclei from say an S process. So you have a star that has a high metallicity, you already have um, a small contribution of heavy elements. And as your super, the star explodes as a supernova, the shock wave travels outwards. And as the supernova shock wave goes through each layer, you rise the temperature. So here is temperature as function of time. So here this layer doesn't know that the shock's here yet. It gets hit by the shock, the temperature goes up, and then it expands and cools again. And the idea is that with these high temperatures, the photons are energetic enough to no knock out neutrons and, or alpha particles from pre-existing nuclei. So this sketch over here, again, the filled circles are stable isotopes. You hit these um, isotopes with photons. If you knock out a neutron, you're going one to the left. If you knock out, for example, here an alpha, you're going over and down because you knock out two neutrons and two protons. And people do calculations. So here's part of this um, gamma process path. So this here up here is lead. So your S process makes all of these heavy elements. You get hit by the supernova shock wave. The photons di start dissociating your, or knocking out neutrons from your pre-existing nuclei. So you're um, knocking out neutrons from lead. At some point you can't knock out any more neutrons, but then you can knock out an alpha particle and then you, this continues. The solid lines are the strongest fluxes and then the shorter the dash is, the weaker the flux. So you see that in, there's many um, elements where you knock out neutrons and then there's a main path that kind of proceeds on the proton rich side of these stable isotopes here. And it turns out you can reach all of these P isotopes here with this process. There's different calculations being done. So these are just two examples from different years, different groups, but the overall picture is the same. So I'm showing again this overproduction factor, so relative to what you had before. And you see th that the, uh, for the heavy P nuclei, things look fine, but if you look on the light side, so these light P nuclei, and especially molybdenum and ruthenium, down here, they're way underproduced. So this gamma process works quite well for the heavy P nuclei here, but it doesn't it fall short for the light P nuclei. So I added to this figure, sort of down here to indicate lower abundances, the P nuclei with the gamma process. So what I've used to introduce you to the S process, the R process, and the gamma process are solar system abundances. But those are not the only observations we have that can tell us about the origin of the heavy elements. In particular, we have these old metal poor stars that can tell us a lot. So let me start, as I'm a theorist, so I'll explain to you how you get abundances from stars as an observer. I think this makes a lot of sense. So start with the bottom left corner down here. So we get abundances from stars through spe spectroscopy. So we look for absorption lines and match out those up with, with the elements. And from the line width and depth, you can determine what the abundance is in the star. So what I show here are different absorption spectra. They're shifted vertically so you can see all of them as function of wavelength. So the first one up here that has a lot of wiggles is at solar metallicity. So that's a star, might actually be a solar spectrum, that has the same heavy element content as the sun. And you see there's lots of absorption lines, meaning there's lots of different elements. There's some highlighted, there's 
three iron lines highlighted here, and there's neodymium. Now, if you take a star that has a lower metallicity, so as we go down, each of these spectra has a lower metallicity, meaning a smaller heavy element content. And you see that as we go, go down, these, all of these absorption lines start disappearing. You still have the strong iron features, but if you go even further down, they become smaller. And if you look at a star with minus 5.4 in metallicity, which at the time this figure was made was the most metal poor known star, you're trying to extract abundances, of, you're trying to look for absorption lines in a spectrum that pretty much looks flat. So it is difficult to get abundances from these low metallicity stars, but we have made a lot of, the field has made a lot of progress in the last maybe five to 10 years. And so now we know abundances, at least for some elements, for a lot of uh, metal poor stars. So once we have that, we can plot, we pick an element, and since we're talking about the R process, we can pick europium and plot the europium abundance of each of the um, metal poor stars we've, we looked at as a function of metallicity. And you can look at these trends, and I think you've already learned a lot about this yesterday. So for europium, we see two features. We see that the scatter where these points are decreases as you go to higher metallicity. But we also see that europium is made already at the lowest metallicities. And so if you remember back about what I told you about primary and secondary processes, the, um, if you want to make europium at very low metallicities, it has to come from a primary process. And europium we use as a marker for the R process. So with combining all of this, having europium abundances at very low um, metallicities, meaning we have R process at very low metallicities, means that we need, that gives us a constraint an extra constraint on the site for the R process. It has to be something that can occur already very early on in the galactic evolution. So if you have to wait for a, like an S process, you would not see these abundances down here. So the, the two points that I want you to carry away from this slide is that there's a significant scatter at low metallicities and that we see R process already at the lowest metallicities. So the previous figure had one element for lots of stars. So now I'm showing you tens different stars with their phone numbers here, but all the elements we know for these stars. Again, they're vertically shifted so you can see them all. Here's the abundance in this log epsilon um, notation that observers use as a function of the atomic number. <coughs> the absolute numbers for the abundance are not relevant, but what is relevant, if you look at, so each set of colored points is for the corresponding star. On top, there's a solar system R process calculation in blue. So the blue line's the same for all 10 stars. And it's matched up at europium with each of the data sets. So you pick one element, you match your observed data points with your line. And then you look what happens to all the others. And you can see a remarkable agreement over here. So in this range, which we call the heavy end of the R process, there's a remarkable agreement between all these different stars and matching this blue solar system R process um, abundance distribution. You can also see it down here where we show the difference between the observed data and the solar system R process. There's vertically no scatter. So this is what we call a robust R process pattern. Looks the same in every star and it matches up very well with the solar system R process. The same is not true over here on the light end. So these are, so the, the three elements I can point out that are observed in almost every star, strontium, yttrium, zirconium at 38, 39, and 40. And then for some stars, we have a few more elements. The reason we don't have them for all of the stars is because they're extremely difficult to observe. And some of them you can only observe, for example, at UV wavelength, so you need HST, and there's a lot less HST time available than optical time. But you see, in, if you look at these lighter elements here, the scatter is much, much bigger. So this robust R process pattern and our explanation of the R process seems to work fine for the heavy end, but not so much for this light end. You can go even further. So now I'm just picking three stars and they're normalized here. And now we look for the same light element um, contribution. Some stars, 
also have the have make um, have high abundances in the heavy end, and the other stars don't have high abundances in for the heavy R process elements. So basically, we have metal poor stars, some that make this robust heavy end, and some that don't. So these are two or three examples of the two categories. And this is an, we take this as an indication that there's two R process sites. A main R process, which is the type of R process I've been talking about so far, that makes also this heavy, heavy end at the very robust pattern. And then there's a stellar lighter element primary process, or weak R process, that only makes these um, R process elements at the lighter end, but is not efficient at all in producing this heavy end here. Let me talk a little bit about this LEP or lighter element primary process. So this was first, so at first the R process was called a weak R process. And then there was this work by Claudio Travaglio in 2004 where they found, where they needed, they looked at galactic chemical evolution of strontium yttrium zirconium and S only isotopes. So isotopes that in our classical understanding can only be made by the S process. But they were underproduced by the S process. So they needed an extra process to help make their model match with observations. So they ob had strontium yttrium zirconium observations as a function of metallicity, and they had a chemical evolution model that included an S process and an R process. And they could not get the model to match with observations at the lowest metallicities. Unless they added in an extra process that they called the LEP or lighter element primary process, summarizing in the name what is required. It has to be primary, so no pre-existing pre nuclei needed. And it only makes this lighter, so lighter element is relative. These are lighter heavy elements, so the strontium yttrium zirconium region. So you need a process that only makes these lighter our process elements and is a primary process. If you add that, then they could exp their model match the observations. Since then, people have also looked, so this is called a solar LEP, people have also looked in metal poor stars and it turns out the same, the same um, deficiency you can explain by a stellar LEP. So now we talk more about the stellar LEP or LEP instead of a weak R process for the process that is responsible to make heavy elements in those metal poor stars that don't have high europium abundances, that only have high abundances in the lighter end of the R process elements. Now this gives us an additional constraint on the origin of elements. One more thing you can look at is you can do a nucleosynthesis calculation and you can say, well, let's just look at two different categories. We do neutron-rich nucleosynthesis, sort of an R process-like nucleosynthesis for this LEP. You get some abundance distribution. There's th three different calculations shown here in solid, dashed, and dotted lines. And you can compare this to observational data, which are the points with the error bars. And then you can say, well, let's do something completely different. Let's see if we have a proton-rich environment, if that matches better. So you do the same thing. You do different calculations. You compare them to the observation. And the conclusion you can um, make from this exercise is you both match more or less well. If you only have neutron-rich conditions, you find that the close neutron shell at 50 or mass number of 90, you're only overproducing. So you can only have a fraction of the total ejecta that makes these, um, these LEP abundances can be neutron-rich, or in other words, you do need some contribution from a proton-rich environment to better match the observed abundances. So now we have three constraints. We know we need an R process at the lowest metallicities. We um, think we need, there's two types of R processes, a main R process and a weak R process or LEP process. And we also have the constraint that there's some contribution from a proton-rich environment, which should be something completely different than an R process, because there's no neutrons, so you can't do it, an R process under proton-rich conditions. So coming back to the site of the R process, the first thing that people looked at were neutrino-driven winds. 
because core collapse supernovae, they're the end of massive stars, so they occur very early on in the galactic evolution. So that's good. That could, if they make the R process, that could explain the high, the europium abundance is at low metallicity. And the conditions of, in the neutrino-driven wound were thought to be compatible with what you need for an R process. So neutrino-driven wind is an ideal site for the R process. The idea was, or is, so here is your proto-neutron star that emits neutrinos. You have the shock wave somewhere out here. And these neutrinos coming from the proto-neutron star, they drive um, a wind. And in this wind, the idea is you start out at high temperatures. So you start out in, in NFC abundances. And as it cools, as time goes by, it expands and cools. So going to the right here, you first start building um, iron group nuclei through charged particle reactions. And then once the temperatures drop even lower, that's when your weak R process or main R process or other processes could occur. Let me spend a little bit more time on the neutrinos before I come back to this idea of weak R process, R process, or other processes like the new P process in these neutrino driven winds. So again, different sketch for the same ideas. You have your proto-neutron star in the center here. After the supernova explosion, you have the shock wave out here, the dashed line. There's different regions that we distinguish between the dominant reactions. So there's a heating region where neutrino captures on neutrons and protons dominate. And there's a cooling region where the opposite direction, so neutrino emissions, would dominate. Importantly, in here, there's what we call the neutrino spheres. So this is the radius at which the neutrinos decouple. And so this sets the energy of the emitted neutrino. So these neutrinos that stream out here, out here, the energy of these neutrinos is determined by where this neutrino sphere is. It's deeper inside the proto-neutron star for the heavy flavors like mu and tau neutrinos. So they have larger energies. These are typical energy ranges for the neutrinos. So mu and tau neutrinos somewhere between 20 and 30 MeV. Anti-electron neutrinos between 13 and 19 MeV. And then the electron neutrinos between 8 and 13 MeV. There's many different reactions where neutrinos are important for the neutrino flux that comes out here that drives this wind and that is relevant then for the nucleosynthesis. It's mostly these source terms. So positron electron annihilation going to neutrino antineutrino pair of any flavor or to photons converting to neutrino antineutrino pair. There's also some reactions that only occur for um, electron neutrinos or, anti or electron flavor neutrinos. So the luminosities for the electron flavors are slightly different than for the mu and tau flavors. But basically, you have a large neutrino flux coming out with sort of this energy hierarchy between the different flavors. And towards the end, you'll see why this, the energy of the neutrinos is important to distinguish between our process or, and the proton-rich um, environment. So unfortunately, this idea of the neutrino-driven wind being decided for the main R process turns out not to work. So if you compare to the conditions we would need with the conditions down here that we find in supernova simulations, you find that the conditions required are not realized in the simulations. This figure illustrates the same idea. So this is time scale of the expansion and the entropy of the expansion shown. And in color are highlighted the bands that would allow you to produce the second R process peak or the third R process peak. And then there's some points here for different simulations. And you can see, if you go to very extreme models, you might fall into the second R process peak region. But the neutrino-driven wind conditions don't allow you, from current simulations, to do this third R process peak. But even though the neutrino-driven winds are not the site for the main R process, maybe you can still do this weak R process or LEP process. That's what this question summarizes. And coming back to this idea of needing neutron-rich or proton-rich conditions and proton-rich conditions to fulfill the observations, let's look a little bit more about on into the um, electron fraction and the conditions in these neutrino-driven winds. <coughs> 
So in very, very general terms, your dominant reactions are neutrino captures and neutrons, antineutrino captures and protons, and the inverse reactions. So somehow the balance of these reactions determines what the conditions are in the wind. Your electron fraction is set by these reactions. So the electron fraction is basically the ratio of, of proton abundance to the sum of proton and neutron abundances. The proton and neutron abundances you can approximate by the rates that convert neutrons to protons from these reactions. Of course, the rates for these reactions here, they depend on the neutrino luminosities. So how many neutrinos you have and on the neutrino energies. The more the energy difference between electron and anti-electron neutrinos than the absolute numbers. And so by looking at this argument, you can say, well, if this energy difference between anti-electron neutrino energy and electron neutrino energy is less than four times the mass difference between neutrons and protons, or about 5.4 MeV, you end up with proton-rich conditions. If this energy difference is larger than 5.2 MeV, you end up with neutron-rich conditions. So it really matters what the neutrino properties are to determine from these reactions what your Y is and what the conditions are if you end up in a proton-rich or in a neutron-rich environment. Of course, there's a lot of details that you need to take into account that of nuclear physics that go into getting the correct neutrino um, energies and luminosities. So there's been, between the first simulations that found proton-rich conditions and now there's been improvements and these, these energy difference has changed a little bit, but the overall statement is still true. If you, this difference is less than 5.2 MeV, you get proton-rich conditions. And there are simulations that find um, proton-rich conditions. So here are three examples shown in different ways, but all of these figures show you proton-rich um, conditions in neutrino-driven winds. So here, above 0.5, this region here, if you look at 0.5, this region here, proton-rich. This is a histogram, here is 0.5, so everything to the right of here is proton-rich ejecta. So there are core collapse simulations with proton-rich conditions. And if you have these proton-rich conditions, you can have another process that makes some of these lighter heavy elements or LEP elements that maybe even make some of the light P nuclei that we learned when I talked about the gamma process, that they're underproduced by the gamma process. So how does this extra process that we call the neutrino P process or new P process, how does it work? So we have proton-rich conditions and we have lots of neutrinos. Both are fulfilled in, in neutrino-driven winds in core collapse supernovae. You have lots of neutrinos and we just learned what the conditions are, the requirements are that you get proton-rich ejecta. So there's another nucleosynthesis process called the RP process that proceeds on the proton-rich side of stability. It doesn't, it occurs in um, X-ray bursts. Most of the material doesn't get ejected, so it has nothing to do with the R process and heavy element discussion, but this neutrino P process follows a very similar path. That's the only reason I mention it here, with a very crucial difference. The difference is that the time scale for this R pre process is much longer than for a neutrino-driven wind in a core collapse supernova, which means if you have to wait for some nuclei with a long half beta half-life to decay, the, um, the, super, the time scale for this neutrino germ wind is much, much shorter. So if you have to wait, you're basically stuck there. And the first nucleus, the lightest one that has a long half-life is this germanium-64. So if you make germanium-64 in this neutrino germ wind, but you have to wait for this to decay, which would give, get you here, so this is a beta plus decay because we're on the proton-rich side of stability, you could not continue the nucleosynthesis because waiting for this decay takes way too long. But that's where the neutrinos come in. So remember, we have proton-rich conditions and we have lots of neutrinos, which means this reaction, anti-electron neutrino capture and protons, provides a neutron source. So if you, these abundant protons react with some of the anti-electron neutrinos, you can make a little bit of neutrons, even though free neutrons, even though overall your environment is proton-rich. So this is illustrated up here, where I show abundance as a function of time, and there's two 
sets of lines are solid and dashed. Solid is with neutrinos and dashed is a calculation without the neutrinos. So basically a calculation where everything is the same but this reaction cannot take place. So if you see up here helium-4 is very abundant and protons, these two lines are virtually on top of each other. Here's your nickel-56. So overall you're in a proton-rich environment. Your neutrons are many, many orders of magnitudes down here. But this reaction here can make a three to four orders of magnitude difference in these low neutron abundances. So with, without this reaction, you would be down here. With this reaction, you're up here. And this difference, even though these are very low abundances, make a crucial difference for the nucleosynthesis. Because now you have proton-rich or neutron-deficient nuclei and you have some neutrons. So this germanium-64, instead of beta plus decaying here, it can capture a neutron and emit a proton, which has the same net effect, but it's, the time scale is much, much faster. Once you've overcome this waiting point, then you have lots of protons, so you, cap you can capture again a proton. And you can do a sequence of these proton captures and P reaction, proton capture and P reaction. Sometimes you capture several protons, and this way you can move up to higher elements, so you should picture this path again in a proton number versus neutron number figure. And so you can make heavier elements on the proton-rich side of stability, where these light P nuclei are. This process is not efficient enough to go all the way to europium or even higher, but you can make, so here I show abundance as a function of mass number, and these high abundances here, these are the strontium yttrium zirconium region. So you can very easily and naturally make exactly the elements that this LEP process that was proposed by Travaglio was short in and needed. So with the new P process, we now have a concrete um, candidate for this LEP process. So summarizing what I talked about so far is I went through the different processes that make heavy elements from the S process that goes all the way up to lead but is a secondary process, the gamma process that can make the heavy P nuclei but underproduces the light P nuclei, the R process that is a primary process where neutrino driven winds would, could be an um, ideal site but don't quite work out, but there's other sites that might also work. And then I talked about an additional process, this neutrino P process, that is a candidate for the LEP process that can happen if you have proton-rich neutrino driven winds and that can contribute to solving some of the problems with the gamma and the R process. So I think this is a good place to stop. Any questions? Yes. Yes. So you're referring to um, this one. So the the rotation changes, if you have a rapidly rotating star during star evolution, this changes the mixing and how the layers, so in a very simple picture we think of massive stars as being this onion layer with hydrogen, helium, and so on. But of course there is some mixing between shells and with the rotation this mixing is different than without, so you have the stellar structure is different and you have, if you for example mix, in some way can mix protons further down, you have a different composition, so your environment to, um, for the S process then to take place is, is different. So it changes the stellar structure and the, the abundance distribution within that stellar structure. If you have more rotation, you get more S process. It, yeah, you basically have a stronger mixing and you have a stronger weak S process, which are these points up here. Yes. A quick question on the gamma process. Uh, you essentially talked about photons knocking out neutrons, but is there some signature, signature for photons knocking out protons, or is that just suppressed too much by Coulomb and Boltzmann? So no, it's much more suppressed than, than knocking out neutrons. Is that just the Coulomb and Boltzmann just slowing down 
Yeah, and the, the, the it's Coulomb repulsion, and I think you need a lot more energy for for knocking out protons than the gammas in in these conditions. Plus, if you knock out protons, well, I guess you, if you want to make these um, p nuclei that are on the proton-rich side of stability, you would still have to move somehow, first get there and then knock out protons. Yes? Can you expect uh, this uh, gamma processing in neutron stars to be like this? No, so this, this only occur, um, in, in this gamma uh, process picture, you need, so this is in the supernova explosion, but not where the neutrino driven wind is, but much further out. So these are the layers with oxygen and neon, so the outer layers of the star that get hit by the shock wave as it, it goes out. So it's not the same place. The neutrino driven wind is much more at the center. So you, have, you should think of your supernova explosion having the proton neutron star that emits neutrinos. And then outside of the proton neutron star, you have all the, the rest of the stellar material in, let's keep it a simple picture in, in onion-like layers. And you have the shock wave that moves through these layers. So this gamma process, this in, Increase in temperature is if you're out here in a layer and your supernova shock wave moves out, when it hits that layer, your temperature goes up. That's where you get the photons for this gamma process. The neutrino driven wind is you have here your proton neutron star, it emits neutrinos, and these neutrinos drive some matter outflow from the proton neutron star. So this is much further inside than these layers out here where the gamma process is. In neutron star mergers, you your material is basically neutrons because you have neutron stars. So you don't have these pre-existing heavy nuclei that you can um, knock out neutrons with gammas. Other questions? No? All right, then I'll turn it over to the next speaker.